just be a drummer. Um, I used to play in the band with you guys, and uh, I thank God that uh, we, we serve together. and We are serving together, but in different ways now. Um, Aș vrea mai întâi să vă spun, uh, mulțumesc Domnului că sunt aici. Uh, am lucrat mult uh, săptămâna asta și am venit acasă mai târziu și n-am mâncat dimineața asta că am fost în fugă. So, sunt un pic uh, uh, tired right now, so I'd appreciate dacă, dacă vă rugați pentru mine și ca cuvântul să pătrundă inima noastră. Um, așa cum a zis, mă numesc Adrian Buia, sunt al doilea băiat al lui uh, fratele Emil și, și Uța Buia și sunt nepotul lui frate Ionică și frate Aurel. Și um, aș vrea să vorbesc, să vorbesc în engleză câteva cuvinte, în special uh, la, la tineri și la noi, dar um, și e foarte important ca noi toți să învățăm de la de lecția asta care am pe, pe inimă scurtă. Um, nu o să fiu lung, dar aș vrea să vă Uita, uh, să vă uitați țintă la, la cuvintele care uh, citești și care se, pre, se vede și să ascultați bine. Că eu, o să vedem că, că după, după lecția asta mică, um, poate, că, poate că câțiva din voi o să, o să vă schimbați gândirea un pic. Să, o, o să vedem. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, to read a few things. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. This is where I want to read the, the main text. I'll be skipping around through a lot of verses uh, and also through the, the text that was read in John 6. Um, but Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21. Listen carefully. Um, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Amen. Um, in context, this is a this is a very important passage to understand. But uh, I just want to ask you a quick question: uh, How many of you think that these people actually did that? Can you raise your hand? Well, okay. First of all, how many of you understand English? <laughs> okay. How many of you don't understand English? Anyone catch that? I ask in English. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, in, in, in context, it makes sense, of course, that these people actually did that because Jesus, first of all, doesn't say, no, you didn't. Okay, first of all. Second of all, why would Jesus use this example um, to teach his disciples something and, uh, and these people that he's, he's talking about never, never did these things? You know, so I just want right off the bat, you know, some people think, well, Jesus doesn't say, yeah, yeah, you did. He doesn't say it directly, but it's implied because... He doesn't say no, and he also adds, yeah, that's what you did, but you're also workers of lawlessness. That's what he finishes with. But here's, here's my main question. Are these, uh, who thinks these people were Christians? Raise your hand high. I can't tell if you're, okay. Who thinks they, they never were Christians? Anybody? I'm alone here? Wow, I'm, fast. I'm actually, I'm very, very interested right now. Um, okay, well, I don't think that they were ever Christians. And I'll explain to you why. Um, it's hard for certain people to understand or to accept uh, someone, people that do these things uh, and for them not to be Christians. And, uh, and it's kind of scary uh, to, to, to realize that we don't want to accept that. But um, I think it's because we live... Uh, our lives usually looking to, you know, to our experiences, to our philosophy, how we think, how we feel, how we understand this world, instead of going to the Bible and reading it word for word and understanding exactly what it says and taking it seriously, which, which personally that, that really bothers me in general, 
Uh, and I think it hurts, hurts God that, uh, that in his, his love letter to us, we, we kind of just treat it as principles, as pictures, ideas, stories, you know, not, not totally applicable to our day because we're modern or whatever. I don't know. There's a lot of reasons for it. Um, but I'll just deviate a little bit to, to give you a, a quick example of how easy it is for us to overlook some simple and obvious things that are actually pretty, pretty mysterious and pretty you know, mind-boggling, at least for me. Um, turn really quick to uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to quickly try to read through uh, a few verses. Revelation 7, chapter 1, I mean, chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, and no wind might blow on the earth or sea against any tree. Hmm. So there's, there's four corners to the earth. That's, that's a bit odd, kind of a weird picture. Um, turn to Psalm 75, 3, keeping that in mind. Seventy-five, three. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keeps steady its pillars. So the earth has pillars. Has some, you know. It's in, it's interesting to to think certain people for thousands of years used to think the earth was flat. How many of you, as kids, maybe thought that, or you think that? Okay, you know, if you never were taught in school that the earth was actually a ball. Uh, you would probably imagine, yeah, it, it looks flat. It's far. There's high parts and low parts, but it's, it's pretty much flat. And the sun goes around us. That's, that's naturally what we would first think. And for thousands of years, this is, in fact, people were, were burned at the stake for, for believing otherwise. There were, there were other church, I think the Catholic Church or, or other groups that were, were really pushing. They were, they, and they, even some people tried to go to the Bible to, to kind of support this. But then it's, it's interesting, and I'm not, I'm not going to take the time to turn to it, but in Isaiah 40 and Proverbs 8, it talks about the circle of the earth and drawing a circle across the heavens of the earth. And it's, it's like, okay, is the Bible contradicting itself? It's, it's talking about a, a kind of a flat or, or four corners, or, but then it's talking about the earth like a circle. And, uh, and this little small controversy is solved in Luke 17.31. Let's turn to this. Luke 17.31. It's amazing to me that, uh, that uh, you can prove that the Bible is true. You know, some people, some atheists might ask and some might come to you and, and might think, well, how do I know this is the word of God? How do you know? Well, one of, the, one of the simple things is, you know, if the Bible teaches something that science or, or other people thought for thousands of years was true, but the Bible got it right from the beginning, it must have come from God because, you know, no one, no one would have known otherwise. Well, in, in Luke 17, verse 31, Jesus is talking about uh, his second coming. And he says, On that day, let no one who is in the housetop with his goods, let no one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. And if we're not going to take the time to do it, but if you look in Matthew 24, verse 39, it's the same Bible teaching. But he talks about men working in the fields and, and women working uh, somewhere else in, in the evening or, or making a meal or something like that. How many of you see this Bible passage as a proof to fix you know, the, the controversy of is the earth flat or is it round? How many of you see that in this text? You, so you understand that in this text, this text is basically saying, no, the earth isn't flat, the earth is round. Can you see that? Or how many of you don't, don't see that? You don't understand why? How many of you don't care to read? Okay. Um, well, 
I'm kind of tempted to kind of just leave it up in the air and let you figure it out, but uh, I don't think that's, that's too productive. So real quick, I'll just, just mention to you, uh, where would, would this world work? Uh, would, this, would this scenario that Jesus is explaining, would it work if the earth was flat? Well, it says there will be people in bed sleeping, and then in Matthew it says there will be people working in the day in, in the fields, and then there will be women work grinding and then at nighttime making. So wh how in the world can there be daytime and nighttime at the same time if the earth was flat? In other words, the earth has to be round. There has to be daytime and nighttime for, for this, for the Bible to be true. The earth has to be, okay? And, and obviously it is. We know that now, but for thousands of years, nobody knew that. So, so it's interesting to me that it's, it's hidden. In the, it's, not, it's not like Jesus is saying, um, this is my teaching, the earth is round, because it's not the point. The point is the Bible supports truth and reality. Okay? But it's, we, don't, we don't see it sometimes unless we look real deep. Okay? So I want to come back to the main passage. And, and I just shared this, this quick example with you just to, to show you. Turning... Uh, you don't have to turn, but remember Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus said, uh, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then these people say that. Well, um, there's, that's, that's the Bible teaching. Jesus said, I never knew you. Now, how many of you, how many of you, you know, think that, that if you're a Christian, you know God and God knows you, um, but then Jesus says, no, I, I never knew. How, how many do you think you were Christians at that point if Jesus said, never? In Romanian, it says, nici odata vam kunostud. That, that's never once. Nici odata. Never once knew you. In fact, in every single translation, that's the actual word. Jesus doesn't say, I don't know you, department. He says, I never knew you. On purpose. To make a point here. Now, it's very hard for me to accept or other people to accept, so this is how we interpret the Bible. This is how I interpret the Bible. I don't interpret the Bible based on, okay, the earth looks kind of flat, so I'm going to believe that, that that's, you know, I'm going to believe the, the verses that talk about the four corners of the earth, where in fact that's probably talking about north, south, east, and west. It's not talking about corners. You know, it's, it's, you need to understand what the Bible is really talking about. Um, but we can't use our tradition or our preconceived you know, notions or ideas, or what we see, what we feel is natural, or, you know, philosophically seem, seems like this is how the world works. I use, personally, and I, and I think this is the best way, I use, I use verses in the Bible to interpret other verses in the Bible. Okay? That's, that's one of the best ways. Obviously, the, the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit teaches us, and then when there's a prophecy or there's a word, you check that with the Bible to see, is that prophecy really true? Because if it doesn't line up with what the Bible says, that's probably not true. You see, there's a, there's a check and balance here, okay? So the way I, I like to do it, there's a Bible teaching, and then there's usually an example, or several examples of that that, that show that. So let's, let's run really quick through three quick examples, and then, and then I'll wrap this up just to... Uh, just to kind of prove, prove this a little bit. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. How many of you know the story of, uh, of the Israelites and Balaam and Balak when, uh, when he led the uh, Israelites to sin? He was trying to curse them. He was paid to do it, in fact, when he couldn't because God restrained him and threatened. Okay, this guy had... Uh, spiritual gifts from God. Okay? He could curse. He could, he could speak for, for God. But it says in 2 Peter, interpreting, you, if you want to read the story, it's in Numbers. We don't have time. But in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, Peter says, talking about certain people in the church, they're like Balaam. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Ber, who loved gain from wrongdoing. And it continues. Now, if you, if, if you understand that, he loved gain, or, or in the King James it says loved wages for doing wrong. He was, he was paid, and, and you can see that. Well, how can you serve God and money at the same time? Because Jesus explicitly said, I'm not going to turn to it, but in Matthew 6, 24, he says that you can't serve them at the same time. Right? You can't be a, a follower of Jesus and worship money or, or do wrong because you're going you're gonna to win as a result. So this, this to me is an example 
where, where, the Bible, where Peter interprets what happens and says, no, 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 this is his identity. This is who he was while he was doing that. And if you read, he's looking, he's asking, maybe God's going to change his mind. Maybe this and that. He, he's, he's looking for a way to, to resist and fight God. Do you think someone who, who recognizes God's there but actively resists God is really, really into that? I, I, I would doubt it. But there are a few other examples. Let's look real quick to Luke uh, chapter 9. Verse 1. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to try to speed things up. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over the demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now skip down to verse 10. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. This is early on in the ministry. Jesus gives power to his disciples, sends them out two by two. They come back and they say, look at all the amazing things that God has doing, done through us. Well, if you turn real quick to John 12, chapter 3. Who were, who were part of the 12 that you think I'm talking about that, that fits this, this example? Judas, very good. Judas, in John chapter 12, is, is noted in verse 3. There's a story of, of Mary coming and uh, breaking the, the oil, or the, uh, not the oil, the, uh, the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. And, and uh, Judas, who is going to betray him, says in verse 5, Why is this ointment sold for, why was this ointment not sold for, for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Because he said this not because he cared about the poor interesting but because he was a thief he was a thief and he and he loved money of course and having charge of the money bag he used to help himself to it and Jesus knew this but he doesn't it's funny that he doesn't say that directly to them he, he gives another reason why not to do that so this is this is Judas's identity during the ministry while Jesus sends him out and he was obviously part of the 12 that did miracles and I, I think there were 70 actually in, in, in another example but just to, to further push this, John chapter 6, in, in the passage that we, we read today, if you, if you finish the chapter, John chapter 6 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, that and, and parts of Romans. Um, but it's, it's hugely controversial because it talks, you know, Jesus is talking about his body and being the bread and people are thinking, well, are you advocating cannibalism? And, and then he talks about God's sovereignty and, and salvation and, and it just gets people so angry and, and some people leave. And after, after this, this starts to happen, Jesus says in verse 63 of John 6, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and truth. There's no excuse for anyone listening to Jesus. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe. And who it was who would betray him. So he's including those who don't believe and the one who would betray him together at that time. But he, he continues... Do you want to go as well? In verse 67, and he's talking, and Peter says, no, why would we go? We have believed because, because Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. Verse 70, very important. Jesus answered to them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil, is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was one of the twelve who was going to betray him. And in verse 65, he says, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. So he's, he's using Judas as his example for his argument for God's sovereignty. So it's, it's clear to me that Judas, during his ministry, during Jesus' ministry, has no excuse, obviously, but he is also identified by Jesus, and I'm not going to take the time, but in John 17, Jesus says, I pray for my disciples, but I don't pray for the world. It's interesting. He doesn't pray for non-Christians. And he also excludes Judas at the very end. He makes him as an exception. I'm not, not for him. So it's clear to me that he's, he's a second example. But real quick, in John 11, the last example where this, um, this teaching is shown, John 11, verse 45, Jesus' ministry is, is getting wildly popular and he just raised Lazarus from the dead. 
And many of the Jews, therefore, in verse 45, who had come with Mary and had seen what he had did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? This man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. You know, as if that's a bad thing. And the Romans will, oh, okay, here. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So they're not believing in Jesus because... They got a place. They got something to lose, right? But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, now note this, Caiaphas was the chief priest that led the crucifixion of Jesus. And other, not led, but like he, he was the one that pushed behind the scenes for all this to happen. He was the one giving out the orders. He was the one judging the whole process. He was the one who actively, actively hated, not passively, not just actively hated Jesus. You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So it seems logical. You know, let's kill one person because, and this is what he's saying from, from himself. He, you know, this is what makes it. But, in verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord or from himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into the children of God who are scattered. And from then on, they made plans to put him to death. He prophesied without knowing the words of God? Turn back to Matthew chapter 7. Is it possible to do signs and wonders and miracles for God to work through you, to have a spiritual gift? And still not be a Christian? Is it possible for the Holy Spirit, not devils, the Holy Spirit to prophesy through you and you not, and it come true and it be real, the work of God, and you not be a Christian at the same time? Is it, is it a possibility? I don't know. What does the Bible teach? Matthew 7, verses 21. Excuse me, 22. On that day, many will say, Did we not prophesy in your name? That's Caiaphas. Okay, did we not cast out demons in your name? That's Judas. Because there's, there's examples that says, even the demons have no power over us. And mighty other works in your name. Balaam, and, and there's other examples. And Jesus says, declares to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Uh, I'm over my time, so I just want to end with, with a quick illustration. This is, this is kind of a scary thought. For me, it was, it was really shocking to see uh, so many of us who, who, who don't read carefully, who don't read the words. Oh, no, Adi, maybe you're, you're getting a little too technical. You're, this is just a little word here. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a big deal. You know, if the earth is flat or the earth is round, that's a big deal. That's science. The, whole, the truth of the Bible can, can fall or stand on something like that. If it's wrong in one place, how do you know it's right anywhere else? Details matter, and they matter to me, and I think they should matter to all of us. So the main, the main point that I want to say tonight is, is yes, this morning, yes, this, this is truth, and this is principle, and this is examples, but it's, it's more than just that. It's Jesus' love letter to us. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up. How many of you have ever had a crush on someone? How many of you young people ever text your, your boyfriend, girlfriend, or someone you like? Have you ever thought, you know, this, this is like Jesus texting you? Right here? That this is uh, proof that he loves you? That we, we, we sing so much tonight. And yet there's some people that, that don't, they, they just go through the motions. They, they know about Jesus. They come to church. They, they probably even do some amazing things like prophesy or, or cast out demons, but they're, they're not Christians. And that, that really bothers me. My encouragement to you um, it's more than an encouragement. I don't know how to say it. It's, it's like it's a burning desire for all of you to, to ask yourselves, if you're doubting, am I, am I really born again a Christian? I mean, I, mean, I can't, I don't, I've never prophesied. I've never witnessed a miracle. Maybe some of you have. I, I have a, I'm, I'm not saying me personally, but I don't really know what, what, what you're thinking or feeling right now. But I just, I, I really hope that... Uh, that if, if this is doubting for you, if, if you're not serious, if you don't hate your sin, if, 
Go ahead and read John chapter, 1 John 1. 1 John, the little book at the very end. If you understand that, I, I personally believe that you, you understand what it means to be a Christian. And, and you really do belong to God. So I don't, want, I don't want you guys to go home thinking, you know, okay, maybe I'm not really a Christian. But if you aren't a Christian, I do want you to feel that. I really do. I want you to doubt it if you're not born again. I want you to doubt it. Because if you don't doubt it, nothing's going to happen. Okay? God bless you guys. Um, how many of you still think they were Christians? Anybody? No? I'm just curious. Okay. God bless you guys. Slava Domnului. Ne bucurăm de copiii noștri, de tinerii noștri că studiază cuvântul Domnului.